Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to another video, and today I'm going to be doing a parts introduction to a new freestyle build that I'm going to be doing. And this video will just be a little up close look at the specific components that I'll be using for the build and just a quick overview of them so that when we get into the build video, we can start that right away so we don't have to make one 45, 50 minute video. So hopefully this will speed things up and give you a better look at the parts by splitting it into two videos. Okay, for the frame, we have the Aux FPV Acrylite 230, and if you follow my channel, you probably recognize I already built one of these, actually. This is my current freestyle quad. This is the same exact frame, the Acrylite 230 here. It's been treating me very well, absolutely no issues with durability, super solid frame. And some of the key features of this guy is it's pretty lightweight. It weighs just about 100 grams. Let's see, I don't have the camera mounts or anything on it here, so this is all the frame. This has steel, all the steel screws, everything in it and it only weighs 98.8 grams. Then you add the little camera mounts and XT60 mount if you want to use that, and it comes up to just about 102 grams. So definitely a very nice weight. I definitely like to keep the weight down on the frame if possible because that saves us an easy 30 grams, and this thing is super solid. You're gonna have a really hard time to break this. And I just printed out the GoPro mount that goes up front here, just bolts on. And like I said, I've been using this one for quite some time now. This is the quad that pretty much my all my freestyle videos for the past two months or so have been filmed on. I'm absolutely loving it. Needs a few repairs right now, but has nothing to do with the frame. And this guy also only costs about $50 from the website, so it's definitely a very nice high quality frame for a very, very reasonable price. So next up, let's move to the motors. So we'll be using some BBB motors, and let's just take a look at the packaging because it definitely deserves a second look. Very nice box with some stickers in it. Lots of foam to protect the motor here, individually wrapped. You have your two lock nuts and your six gold screws there, so definitely very over-the-top packaging on these motors. Just some very nice touches on them. So if we take a look at them, they are the 2207, uh, 2650 kV motors here. They use 7075 aluminum all around. They have the 16 by 16 mounting base, so the um, square instead of 16 by 19. They do use a, a, an aluminum shaft on the outside, however there is a titanium insert. So it keeps the cost of the motor down, but while still giving strength to the shaft. And since it is a 3mm shaft in the bottom, it means you have a bigger bearing, so these are pretty smooth motors. And if you take a look at the windings, they are actually multi-stranded windings there. On the bottom, you can see the magnets are very, very thick. I believe these are N54 SH magnets, so a little bit thicker than the N52 that we're used to. And of course we have this little plastic guard on the bottom to help protect against screws coming up and shorting on the windings. And for the wire lengths, they're not crazy long, probably about 100 millimeters or so. But for this build, we will be using individual ESC, so that's not a problem. But if you are using a 4 one ESC on a 6 inch build, you might have to extend those. But overall, definitely a very nice quality motor for around $15 to $20. And I have been using them on my... Um, one of my racing quads here, these are the Mode 2 motors. These are actually sort of a rendition of the BBB. Pretty much the same exact specs overall with a few tweaks, um, but the same core motor, and I definitely like these guys. Lots of power, pretty smooth, and not terrible on amps. So next, let's check out the ESCs. For the ESCs, we have the Gemfan Maverick 30 amp, and these are the BL Heli 32, the 32-bit edition ESCs. I have one out of the package here. You can see they're actually quite small. They say they are rated for 2 to 6S LiPo, so that's really nice if you want to run your freestyle quad on 5 or 6S to get extra power out of them. They're claiming that they support that. Overall, the quality and construction of them looks pretty nice. Nothing too out of the ordinary. They don't have the um, LED on them like the Betaflight ESCs do, and they also don't come wired to support the 32-bit telemetry. However, I'm honestly not interested in that, and I would much rather have an ESC in this small form factor than the Betaflight ESCs that are pretty giant, as you can see there. So this is going to save a decent bit of weight as well. We just have our main power connections coming off here. Looks like they are 18 gauge, and then our single signal wire here. It looks like they didn't include an extra ground, but we're just going about this distance to the flight controller, so it shouldn't matter there. So nothing too special on the ESCs. Pretty much they all work just about the same for me, but these should be pretty solid, and they will fit really nicely on these skinny arms. So let's check out the flight controller. All right, for the flight controller, this is pretty much a star of the show. We have the Betaflight F7 board on here. So you can see right away that it features the gyro with the ribbon cable that is isolated in the little silicone thing here with a hard plastic um, cover to help protect it. I'm not exactly sure 
the gyro name. I forget what it is, but it is the 32 kilohertz gyro. They're working on that F7 code right now. However, a really interesting feature of this guy is you can actually take this off. There's just four little screws underneath here. Unplug this, and then you also have an MPU 6000 gyro right there if you want to use that. I'm pretty sure you just do something in the CLI to enable that, or maybe they're working on um, utilizing both gyros together, but it is nice to have the option. And this is the newer version of the Betaflight F4, which I have in this quad. And honestly, not a big fan of Betaflight F4 just due to the layout of it. So with this flight controller, I'm definitely happy to see the layout has changed a lot. The ESC pads are not on the bottom. That is definitely a big downside. The other one, it makes repairs very difficult. So here, pretty much all the pads are on the top here. You can see you have your ESC pads along the bottom sides there. And then you have other pads along here. They are nice big pads to solder to, not through holes. I'm a fan of pads versus through holes, just a personal preference. Um, however, these ones are not labeled, so you have to look up the manual to check that out. However, the main input power leads, um, the positive and negative for your main input, is still on the bottom, so you're going to have to solder those up. But those are going to be a lot less likely to need to be repaired than, say, your ESC wires if you break an ESC. So I'm, I'm all right with that, especially since this chip takes up so much extra space. And the F7, hopefully you can see, is actually hidden underneath this guy. You can see just how huge that is underneath the gyro here. I am a bit worried about this ribbon cable. Not a fan of these types of setups, but we'll have to see how that goes. On the bottom, of course, you just have a 5-volt back. I believe it's 2 or 3 amps. Have our current sensor right there, as well as the Betaflight OSD. Pretty much standard all around, this F7 just brings with the new gyro, the new chip, and the new layout, obviously. As well as we do have these little rubber grommets along the outsides to help um, soft mount and put that right down. So next, let's check out the video system. So to start off with the camera that we'll be using, I'm going to be using a Foxier Micro Aero Pro. This is just the little 2.1 millimeter micro lens. The frame fits micro cameras. I have the same exact camera in my other Acrolyte 230. Just works really well for me, and these guys are only $20, so it's a really nice price for a great CCD camera. Obviously, you can use a different camera if you want. This frame will accept full-size and mini cameras, depending on the mount you choose when you check out on the site. Um, but I just prefer micro cameras to save the weight. Um, but you could also use a Predator or a Micro Eagle or a Micro Sparrow from Runcam if you wish as well. This is just what I'll be using. For the VTX, it's pretty much my go-to. This is the TBS uh, Unify HV Race, the Pro Edition here. So this only does 200 milliwatts. I've gone well over a mile on 200 milliwatts with zero issues. So it's plenty enough for me. And for the antenna here, I'm going to be pairing it with, this is actually the new Foxier Lollipop, which is pretty much modeled after the Axie. There's a lot of debate going about, on about that right now. But it's a pretty nice, lightweight, very durable antenna with the cap here. And it'll just run pretty much out the back of the quad here so it doesn't stick out too much actually if you want to do a longer range setup you could use a longer antenna like a triumph because you can um, get it to stick out a little bit more get more clearance between the carbon when you bend it up this is actually um, the antenna i used to go well over a mile on but i don't expect any issues using the lollipop here even if i did want it to push out to longer range so it should work just fine and these guys are only 10 bucks a piece so that's pretty nice and lastly, for the receiver, I'll just be using the trusty FreeSky X4 RSB. I know a lot of you guys will probably be criticizing me for using this sort of older and outdated receiver, but it's just this most solid receiver for me. Once again, this is the receiver in my other Acrolyte in the back here, and that's the one that did 1.25 miles, no problems, and it just works the best for me. I've used the other receivers like the XSR, the RXSR, um, and they work just fine for me. However, the reason I've switched back to these as my main receiver is that in a race environment, I found about maybe once every week or so, I would have a failsafe and a lockout in a race, and that's just not acceptable to me. And it wasn't like I was getting a lowest uh, RSSI loss warning. It just completely locked out on me right away. So I have moved back to these receivers, and I haven't had a single one of those lockouts since. So it's just what I run. It is more expensive and bigger than the new micro receivers, but it's most solid for me, so I'm going to keep running it for right now. All right, so there we go. That's going to bring us to the end of this parts introduction. Hopefully, I covered everything in adequate detail without making too many mistakes. Um, but there will be links down below to all the products here if you're interested in checking them out. If you like the video, please subscribe. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for the build video coming soon, and I'll see you in the next one.